is the dollar rally over? Is the federal is the Federal Reserve only going to do one rate hike or even no rate hikes in 2019, down from the three planned rate hikes initially? So the reason I am doing this short live stream today, I'm going to try to keep it below 30 minutes, is that there's a bunch of new Federal Federal Reserve Board of Governor comments that have come out in the last week or so. Uh, over the weekend, Danielle DiMartino Booth turned on Jerome Powell. She had been praising him for a very long time, saying that he was the second coming or a reincarnation of Paul Volcker. And she has totally turned on him, saying that he caved to Trump and others and caved to the stock market correcting, and that now there may only be one more rate hike in 2019 or no rate hikes. And seconding some of the other information that I just mentioned, we have Jim Bullard, St. Louis Federal Federal Reserve President, St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard. He did an interview on Wednesday talking about he doesn't really want any more rate hikes, that they could endanger an otherwise strong economy. And Bullard is supposed to take on a voting role this year in 2019. So the Fed did four quarter point increases in 2018. We may only get one or none in terms of rate hikes this year. So what do you think? You think we're going to get zero? You think we're going to get one? You think by the end of this year that the Fed's going to totally reverse course on rate hikes and their quantitative tightening program? By the way, I just released a short video. I spent over three hours working on that total work to release that product. Hope you guys are appreciative. I wanted to display, so take your time and go watch it. Also go and re-listen to the Victor Sperandio interview I did over the summer. And basically the reason I made the short video, I want number one, I wanted to update you on the Federal, Federal Reserve balance sheet and how it's not quite at 10% of total asset sales yet, but also despite the Fed and other factors that normally would have spiked yields, the yields haven't spiked yet. So I released that short little video. I think it's pretty good. Take a look. Okay, so in addition to the comments that the Fed's, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, St. Louis Federal Reserve President Jim's, Jim Bullard made, we also have comments from Bostick of the Fed, and he currently only sees one interest rate increase for 2019. Then Zero Hedge added some extra caveats in there. Basically, two, if the S&P 500 hits 2,600, three, if the S&P 500 hits 2,800, and four, if the S&P 500 hits 3,000. And then my buddy, Michael Leibowitz, put in a joke below this uh, on a Twitter on Zero Hedge, below the Zero Hedge tweet a couple days ago, saying minus one if the S&P drops to 2,100 and minus two if the S&P hits 1,800. So basically, and this is crazy now, I think we have asset markets, especially the stock market, that it doesn't really move on fundamentals anymore, especially in the short term. A lot of stuff, especially near-term cash generation that hasn't started yet, that could start in a month or two or three, is not priced into a lot of stocks. But we basically now have a stock market. I'm seeing these posts now from a lot of very experienced money managers and stock traders and investors all over Twitter, and I agree with a lot of what they're saying, that we basically now have a stock market because of this integration of social media technology, because of this integration of all these high frequency trading algorithms, which by the way, these high frequency trading algorithms can read tweets. I'll give you an example of this. So these high frequency trading programs are so sophisticated, they knew about the food poisonings at, at the Chipotle restaurants in the Boston metro area and the Seattle Washington metro area weeks before really anyone else and Chipotle announced it publicly. So they knew based on the tweets that people were getting sick getting food poisoning and that people are starting to die. And I've also heard examples of these high frequency trading computers that they scan the prices that hotels charge to see if the rooms are full. So they can do that for consumer, for hotel stocks. But basically the point I was trying to make is that a lot of these experienced Wall Street traders, investors, money managers are saying we have a stock market now that doesn't really move on fundamentals anymore, at least in the short term. And it only moves on liquidity injections, on tweets from key people 
that the high frequency trading algorithm the hedge fund managers follow the high, high frequency trading algorithms creating artificial excessive volatility on their own and federal and federal reserve board of governors comments so comment if you agree with that i think you know a lot of that is true but i wanted to talk about the dollar too because the dollar look like it was going to stay above 97 and it had stayed above 97 for a while but now it's at 95.55 so it's been a couple days below the 97 areas and yes over the last five years the dollar has been in a very wide trading range we have had a dollar rally for essentially a year a very strong dollar rally and there's been a lot more debt building up in the system globally. So people like Grant Williams and Rel Powell would bring up how, yes, the dollar has been in a wide trading range for a while now. But the difference is that even though the dollar has, hasn't really broken out or crashed or anything like that, but the total amount of debt outstanding over this five-year period has increased a lot. So as uh, on each rally for the dollar, the more debt outstanding the more fragile the system becomes. And especially when you're loaning out like subprime credit and a lot of student loan debt, you know, subprime auto, all the all subprime credit cards, you know, high interest rate credit cards, all these types of things. And another thing, another, and this is, this is just speculation on my part, but this is more of an educated guess based on past history because this, there's historical precedent is that perhaps maybe either emerging markets or the European Union governments or the European Central Bank, some type of entity has probably been lobbying maybe the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, maybe even President Trump directly to try to get them to weaken the dollar. And people are like, some people may be like, Jason, you're a conspiracy theorist. Uh, how could you bring this up? Well, there's, there's enormous precedent and enormous evidence from the past for many decades that governments routinely, sometimes even on a daily or hourly basis, go in to currency markets and manipulate or intervene or at least attempt to manipulate and intervene in their foreign exchange rates. Now we have a lot of countries running dollar pegs and euro pegs and that by definition is a manipulation or an intervention. Switzerland, the Bank of Switzerland, their central bank created hundreds of billions of dollars out of thin air running a euro peg. They had to shut it down after three years, and they basically created enough money, hundreds of billions of dollars, to run their own technology hedge fund. They buy and sell mining stocks. They, buy, they have an enormous uh, position in technology stocks. But the historical precedent I wanted to bring up to you guys is the Plaza Accord. So this is from Wikipedia. Okay, you can I can attach a link to this in the description section of, of this show after it's over. So the announcement of the ministers of finance and central bank governors of France, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States, commonly known as the Plaza Accord or Plaza Agreement, was an agreement joint by five major industry co uh, countries of France, West Germany, Japan, the U.S., and the United Kingdom to depreciate the U.S. dollar in relation to the Japanese yen and German Deutschmark by intervening in currency markets. The five governments signed the accord on September 22, 1985 at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. The U.S. dollar depreciated significantly since the agreement until it was replaced by the Louvre Accord in 1987. So I, I'm reading you this, I'm telling you this because this supports my argument, supports my point that governments have lobbied the U.S. before, and the U.S. has been willing to go in there when governments say, you know, our our currency is too strong, we need a we need a weaker currency, or well, actually, it would be in reverse. They were saying they would say the dollar's too strong, and we want a weaker dollar because they probably have too too much dollar denominated debt. So that may be it. So the Plaza Accord, and I'm sure there's there's other examples of this. There's been the Brazilian Central Bank getting caught. There was a uh, whistleblower who leaked a ton of information to Bloomberg from the Central Bank of Brazil, admitting that Brazil was way in over its, the Central Bank of Brazil was way in over its head, manip trying to manipulate their currency against the dollar before the, these past October elections, and it backfired. Okay, the stream temporarily went offline. That was weird. 
I don't know why we're having these types of weird problems, but can you guys still hear me? The stream temporarily went offline. I guess we've been having more of that now lately. I don't know why. Okay, so let me just check my notes here really quick. Yeah, so my speculation could be maybe the European Central Bank or the European Union politicians asked the Fed to weaken the dollar because they were worried that the dollar was going to go a lot higher on the dollar index, way past 97, and maybe it's taken a little break because things were getting real, real bad in Europe very, very quickly. And there's a new Axios article, too, about Jerome J. Powell. I'll attach a link to it. It's by Dion Rabuin. I think I screwed up his last name. Jerome Powell's attempts to please everyone have backfired. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Okay, so a couple more current event stories before I let you guys go that, that I want to talk about. So we have U.S. fracking wells are producing far less than forecast. There's been a number of stories released on Zero Hedge this week about that so at an oil price let me see what we're, we're at with the oil price we're at an oil price we're still at 52.33 i think wti which is still not that good that if the oil wells are not producing as expected with their debt load those oil companies are going to have to raise equity or they're going to have to work with their banks to get them to maybe push the maturity dates out on some of the debt otherwise we could have massive bankruptcies because the, the oil producers, if they have hedges, they have to keep delivering into the hedge. But as those hedges wear off, they're still stuck with the debt and they don't have the revenues they were projecting to pay it back. So I've already seen articles um, mentioned, well, it was mentioned in these two Zero Hedge articles, that the CapEx spending that's going into like the Permian Basin and some of the other shale wells, uh, shale areas, shale plays, are going to be a lot lower than expected, than projected. So that means... Um, unfortunately for a lot of our listeners in Texas or Oklahoma, I hope that doesn't happen, that, that there's going to be a big bust there and hopefully they don't lose their jobs, but it might happen. I also saw an article and I posted this in the wall street for mean street Facebook group. It's about the Chinese middle class is buying up us residential real estate. And yes, it's common knowledge that Chinese buyers have been buying us real estate for a while. However, what this article says is that Chinese are now taking on more mortgage debt to buy. They're pooling their resources and they're even taking on mortgage debt to buy U.S. houses and they're buying U.S. houses in states that they did not buy them before. So they're going into Georgia, Texas, Florida. They're going into other states besides California and some of the other states that they never went into before. Uh, my friend Phil, shout out to Phil. Uh, he sent me this article about monetization and markets or why fundamentals don't matter, liquidity does. It was reposted from Chris Hamilton of Economica blog about interest on excess reserves. This just looks like just another potential manipulation scheme. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, not only, so she wants everyone, this crazy, super radical socialist politician who, by the way, she's a champagne socialist. She was already a champagne socialist before she moves to D.C. She's moving to D.C. where there's even bigger champagne socialists here. So she was already with her ideologies in a basically a bubble, divorced from reality. And so she's coming to the D.C. metro area bubble, which is one of the biggest bubbles, which is even more divorced from reality from what's happening to the people on Main Street. So her champagne socialism is only going to get more excessive. She's only going to get, you know, more deals, more money in her pocket. She's going to end up probably marrying a really, really rich guy. And she's going to have be worth like $10, $20 million. Meanwhile, she's proposing all these crazy things like a 70% tax on the rich for her Green New Deal that's estimated to cost, you know, many trillions of dollars and potentially collapse the economy. She's also talked in the past about universal health care, which estimated that would cost. And from our listeners in Europe and Canada, that is not working so well. It's not covering medications. The care isn't quite as quality that she and she's saying that oh it works in the united kingdom universal health care and it works in france and it works in canada and it works in scandinavia but it's projected that universal health care for the much larger u.s population you know we have over 300 million people here in the u.s so a scandinavian country with only 5 million or 10 million people it's a lot different to do universal health care something else it doesn't scale as well but 
the projections for universal health care here in the United States are like $30 trillion. So Alexandria, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has not even been in Congress for a month, and she's already proposed, because she's a hardcore radical, blind ideologue, new policies that could potentially add tens of trillions more in liabilities to, US, to the U.S. government. <laughs> Welcome to dystopia, right? And, and unfortunately, she has like an army of social media supporters already who either love her or are being paid to protect her online. And I think she's being groomed to be president in like 2024, between 2024 and like 2032. Range. Because she checks off, you know, the um, identity politics and social justice warrior boxes. So she checks off like all the boxes. But I mean, her ideologies are nuts and the, the stuff she's proposing. But yeah, she's coming to a another bubble here in the D.C. metro area that's totally divorced from reality. And she was already in a bubble, her, her views of the world. Okay, a couple more stories before I let you guys go. Like I said, this is going to be a short one. Short one, I just wanted to get it out there. I'm still working. I think I'm going to have another interview book for tomorrow for another guest. We're almost to 4 million views, guys. Can you freaking believe it? Despite YouTube censorship. We should have like over 50,000 subscribers on this channel and like over 8 million views. Okay, last last story before I let you guys go and then I take a look at the comment section. I haven't looked yet. So, HSBC to pay 30 million to settle bond rigging lawsuit in the US by Joe Jonathan Stemple from Reuters. HSBC has agreed to pay 30 million to settle litigation by investors who accused 11 big banks of rigging the roughly 9 trillion government agency bond market from 2009 to 2015. The settlement with the British bank was made public late Wednesday night in the federal court in Manhattan and requires approval by judge blah blah blah. So HSBC is the third bank to settle after Deutsche Bank and Bank of America agreed in August 2017 to pay a respective 48.5 million and 17 million and cooperate with the plaintiffs. Investors led by two Alaskan government entities, that's interesting. So there was pension plan, excuse me, pension plans and others who sued them. They said that the banks used in the evidence in the discovery phase came out that the banks used chat rooms and other means to share price data and coordinate trading, effectively functioning as a single, quote, super desk, end quote, to reduce competition and boost profit on, quote, virtually every trade, end quote, at customer's expense. And then here's another quote, rare is an antitrust case like this one, where a large volume of smoking gun evidence exists at the pleading stage, end quote. They said in an amendment, amended complaint filed on November 13th. HSBC denied liability but settled to avoid more litigation that could prove, quote, extraordinarily expensive and time-consuming, end quote, according to the settlement agreement. My, my opinion on that would be they, they settled only partially because if they did even more discovery, it would come out that the banks, like, knowingly rigged a lot more markets and then probably the fines would have been larger criminal... I mean, how many criminal charges at this point? What, maybe one or two guys go to prison? So just showing you that, like, from a cost-benefit analysis, these large banks can rig these markets, make billions of dollars in profits, and then only pay a $30 million fine. Welcome to dystopia, right? <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all the current events I have and stuff in my notes, so I could just check the listener questions and comments really quick. And I don't think I talked about any specific companies or investment advice, but I'll just, you know, stupid stupid disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. This is for informational and educational purposes only. And so I'll take a look at listener questions and comments now real quick. Hi, Philip. It's nice to see you too. Well, see you in chat. Dal oh my God, I can't pronounce your name. I screwed up real bad. Dalipt. Is it still a market with only one buyer? I would say no. If the Japanese central bank is the only buyer of JGBs and there is no trading volume, then it's not really a market. And a lot of times there's no trading whatsoever. I would say it's not a market if it's only one buyer. Dorian's Mirror, greetings from Australia. Oh, nice to see you down in Australia. Thanks for joining. Yeah, Dorian, the dollar is still pretty high. So I, I didn't mention this earlier, I forgot. 
I remember it right now. But I'm not convinced the dollar rally's over yet. We have to basically, for me to see that the dollar rally's over, we have to close below like 93, 92, 93 range. So if it goes below 94 and maybe even below 93 in the dollar index and it closes there a number of days in a row, maybe a couple weeks or a month, then I'll be more convinced the dollar rally is over. Watchman 2011. Jim Williams. Oh, John Williams. Okay. From Shadow Stats? Yeah, but he's been calling for hyperinflation for like seven or eight years he said he if you go back and look at his interviews on greg hunter and usa watchdog he's been calling for hyperinflation every six to 12 months for a long time so i'm not sure i'm honestly not sure and you know we have these comments my friends have been asking me my my opinion on this too from the bank of england guy john carney the guy the guy screwed up the bank of wasn't he running the bank of canada and he sold all their gold at the bottom just like gordon brown did at the bank of england so he's a corrupt globalist. He's a hardcore Keynesian. Um, you know, those guys, the thing with these hardcore Keynesians and these rich elite guys from these rich elite universities, and I don't know if they can announce this publicly, but when they come out and say like that the RMB is going to be the world reserve currency, a lot of these guys are secretly rich champagne socialists. I mean, they love globalism. They actually really like all the things that China is doing to their own people, like removing liberties, removing freedom of speech, you know, making them like with, with basically perpetual stagflation. So inflation and taxes, so it's really hard to, so it reduces your standard of living. Basically, you become a wage slave or a debt serf. So they, the, the views of Xi in the West from a lot of mainstream media press and the globalist elites in the West are really, really high. They, You don't hear a lot of criticism about the Chinese Communist Party from a lot of the elites. So the track record, the other point I wanted to make about Carney, Bank of England, his track record is not really good for making predictions, okay? He sold, maybe he was told to do this or maybe he's just a moron, but he sold all of Canada's physical gold, right? Around the same time that England did, basically all at the bottom. So he's not exactly a market genius. He's an academic who has his ideology, has his agenda, and he just ignores reality and then just keeps pushing forward. You know, basically almost exact carbon copy of how a lot of people who are socialists ignore the reality of socialism in the real world and all the damage it's done in the 20th century. Okay, I'm looking through more of your questions and comments. Yeah, Adrian, uh, the feed went out. I don't know what happened. It's back, though. I don't know what happened. Sorry. It's been happening more. Maybe they don't like what I have to say. I don't know. Or it just could be technical problems. I'm not really sure. Hello, Keith. The Permian is considered shale. So if you talk to a lot of oil experts, they consider it shale. Now, the geology is different. I've heard it's more like lasagna. It's more like lasagna where the layers alternate between being economic and not. But most of the experts consider it a shale play. Oh, you think I got, you think uh, my audio is taken out because I talked about the dollar delete? I don't know about that. Hey, thanks, Forza. I'm glad you liked my other short video. Yeah, so there's, there's countervailing forces. What I talked about in that other video, there's a lot of them on both sides. It's a tug of war. So there's countervailing forces because normally you would expect the yields to start spiking with what the Federal, Federal Reserve is doing especially with their quantitative tightening program, but it's not happening. So the markets are not acting rationally. They're acting based on like manipulation and liquidity and tweets and all this. So it, this would support the argument that the experienced traders are making that the markets are not being driven by fundamentals really anymore, or there's very few markets that, that are. In the long run, fundamentals are more priced in in the short and medium term. I don't think a lot of them are anymore.
Okay, guys, well, I think I've done enough for today because I spent a lot of time working on that short video. I see there's a lot of good comments in there. I'm just really tired right now. So I'm going to wrap up this short video. We're, like I said, we're going to keep it under 30 minutes, and I'll attach links to all the stories I talked about in the information section. I don't have time to look at all the comments and questions. I want to go relax and, and work out. So I already spent three hours, over three hours, doing the short video, so definitely go check that out that I released like two hours ago, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, bye for now.